at the height of the Vietnam War, which is to say probably, I think this occurred in 1970, I was returning from a, a, a flight in my helio from Lima Site 32, which is sort of north central Laos on the northern edge of the PDJ, the plane had jarred. It's an hour plus flight, I guess, from that point back to our base at Long Chen uh, or, or uh, Samtong. And uh, I was called by one of our Chinese HF radio operators and advised that there was an airplane and two pilots down at such and such a location. And he gave it to me as a distance and bearing from, from uh, where I was. And not knowing whether it was Air America or, or what, uh, I went ahead and, and turned toward this place. Uh, and it was inside the PDJ on a, a large highway that Pete Parker tells me now is Highway 4. It turned out that it was an Air Force F-4 Phantom jet that had sustained battle damage in a strike uh, in Haiphong and uh, had steered into a neutral and hopefully less hot Laos uh, to head back to Udorn. And uh, they had instructions at the time to get in there and net with Air America if they were going down and we'd try to get them. The Air Force mostly let the SAR net, search and rescue net, to us in Air America in Laos because it was a neutral country, uh, supposedly. But anyway, this, this guy went down in the PDJ and the PDJ to just about all of us in the company was the place you avoided like the plague. Number one, they had big guns, they had a lot of nasty people in there. There was reputed to be at least a main force North Vietnamese division in the eastern and southeastern portion of the PDJ, as I recall. The Plain of Jars, which gets its name from these huge burial urns that are scattered about. Very historic area. These poor F-4 guys went down in the PDJ area, and I wouldn't go in the PDJ area if for anything, and none of us would because they had a lot of bad anti-aircraft, big stuff, 37s, 57s, and so forth, millimeters. But I went down there, and I went down low, figuring that uh, maybe I could get there before I started getting shot at and, and find these guys, and I did. Uh, uh, in fact, they found me before I found them. I talked to the, to the uh, pilot. It turned out to be a full colonel. and. Uh, and he, he had a visual on his backseater who he'd ejected to. In the meantime, the radio operator had gotten a hold of a helicopter, it later turned out to be Charlie White's, I believe. And Charlie quit what he was doing and headed into the PDJ too. But I was down to about 100 feet off the trees, uh, hoping to negate any good gunner's chances of getting me. And, and, and uh, the, the, the front seater uh, heard my airplane and called me on a, 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 a VHF. They had UHF, VHF survival radios, a little handheld yellow thing. And he called me and, and, and then vectored me to him, and I found him. And at the same time, I, for the first time in my Air America career, I, I was on the receiving uh, second time my career in Air America. I was on the receiving end of a 37 millimeter and there was a small mountain between me and the down pilot and these guys really had me dead to right because they had traversed low enough to get me in a 37 shoots an exploding round so even you know they only had to come close to puncture the skin of a helio. Mm -hmm. I had found this guy and I knew about where his back seater was and Charlie's talking to me coming another 30 minutes away in the helicopter so anyway, there was a, uh, a hill, perhaps uh, 200 feet high, maybe, maybe not that high. And when the gun first shot at me, he shot over me, a huge stream of big, nasty-looking trailer tracers. And I, I went behind the mountain where he couldn't get me. And when I got around behind the mountain, I started getting shot at by a gun that had four barrels and lots more bullets. But it was a four-barrel, 23-millimeter anti-aircraft gun. And so on this side, I got shot at by a 37, and on this side by the 23 millimeter, and things were not looking at all good. And I stayed in behind the mountain, but every time I, or the little hill, but every time I poked my head out to talk to the guy on the ground, one of them would shoot at me again. Anyway, this went on for 30 minutes, but I had pretty much located them. And Charlie, bless his heart, 
suggested that I attract their fire, well, he went in and picked up the back cedar, which they thought they had seen. And so I did that. I drove around the north side of the mountain, and the 37 hosed at me, and I kept on going low and fast, and they weren't tracking me good, and they missed me. But then I got in the range of the 23 millimeter, you know, coming around that side. And in the meantime, Charlie had DD'd in there and, and, and picked that guy up and got him out. But the, uh, the front cedar, who I learned later was a uh, Air Force colonel, a very important colonel, too. He had access to an awfully lot of very classified information. Yeah. They captured him. But he told me, just, he said, buddy, you're doing an absolutely outstanding job. But he said, I got to leave you now. He said, these guys are right on top of me. And he said, I'm smashing my radio. And uh, that was the end of that story. But we had a hell of a party back at Udorn that night, too. Uh, the back seater, you know, couldn't, couldn't do enough for Charlie and I. And, and uh, but. That was, that was uh, um, you know, 50% of the loaf, I guess, is better than none, and I'm really glad that we were able to get one of them. But a pretty, pretty sad story, and it happened a lot in our crowd, more to the helicopter guys, certainly, because of their tactical capability, but uh, certainly a lot of us fixed-wing people got involved in sad stuff like that, too. Uh, throughout my years in, in Southeast Asia, and they were all pretty bad combat years, uh, it seemed. Uh, Air America was, of course, a non-combatant, but uh, there was a constant nagging loss among us. Always somebody was getting killed, yeah. especially as they introduced the SA-7 shoulder launch missile. I was in over six years of combat with Air America, and of course it wasn't day-to-day -day combat, but we had, and of course I knew the military guys and how they reacted to down airmen, but if anything, the Air America crew uh, were more tenacious. And we didn't have, typically, we did not have any guns to protect us. And I know of incidents where, where a Jolly Green couldn't get a guy out, and one of our people did. Uh, and I have to give the military their due by saying that we knew the country intimately and knew how many minutes we had to do something before we were not able to do it any longer Keep because of the bad guys being on. in your heart till the time that we must part and hold back the anger for a while darling hold back the anger for a Yeah.